Sometimes you can let your house get so messy that people just want to leave. But after they're gone, you can't just say good riddance. You still got a clean house. We'll talk about that today at Sunday School. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm Father Timothy Matkin, your instructor. I'm glad you've joined us for this session on the Lateran Council Number 5 and the Council of Trent. Before we get into that, if you would look down below and bless that like button, it would help us out greatly, and subscribe to the channel to uh, see more of these kinds of videos. And of course, you can share them on uh, Facebook or Twitter so other people can learn about these topics. Also, before we begin, we want to have some opening prayers. I invite you to join with me, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, and the Collect for the Universal Church from Archbishop William Laud. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now the Collect for the Universal Church. Let us pray. O gracious Father, we humbly beseech Thee for Thy holy Catholic Church, that Thou wouldst be pleased to fill it with all truth, in all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, our study is based upon John L. Murray's book, The General Councils of the Church, with additional resources, and we put some extra links down below. One of the books that I look to for this study is uh, the book by John O'Malley called Trent, What Happened at the Council, which I recommend to you. It's a, a good, nice uh, history book written for a general audience. We've also linked down below to a lecture that he gave on the myths and misunderstandings about Trent. So look down there in the description below for the link to that video. I've also linked in John Henry Newman's attempt in Tract 90 to reconcile the statements of Trent with the 39 Articles of the Church of England, which were formulated during the closing days of the Council. And also, if you want to read more from the Council, there's a link to that. Uh, but beware, when we get to this Council, it is uh, full book-sized documents, uh, which we really haven't had before uh, and won't have again until we get to the Second Vatican Council, when we have another big book comprising all the documents of the Council. Now we'll continue with a study of the Church. Um, in these councils, now last week we looked at the failed attempts of the Second Council of Lyon and of Florence to reunite the Eastern and Western churches. They were able to put together common statements of faith, but the political environment was hostile to reunion, and the political pressure just made it unravel. But the need for reform continued in the church, and the problem produced reformers who tended to be more doctrinal revolutionaries, which in turn discouraged genuine reform. The Fifth Lateran Council addressed reforms, but like Florence, didn't really accomplish much. At last, the simmering problem boiled over in the revolt of Martin Luther and the other reformers who followed. The Council of Trent was called to reform the church, to resolve the doctrinal disputes, and to reconcile the reformers. But it was too late in coming, and once it started, seemed like it would never end. But at last it did conclude, winning over the Catholic West in the process, becoming the dominant council for the next four centuries, 
and recasting Catholicism as Tridentine. Perhaps you've heard of Reformation Day. It takes place on Halloween. And that's because in the eve of All Saints Day, All Hallows Eve, 1517, Martin Luther posted on the door of the Castle Church at Wittenberg, which is basically the, the bulletin board of the day, a printed card stating a number of questions that he, as a college professor, would debate in public. Ever since, this has been considered the official beginning of the Protestant Revolt. The movement, however, did not arise out of nothing all that quickly. It had a long time in coming, centuries long. The nailing of Luther's 95 Theses on the door of the castle church is more a symbol of the movement than the actual start of it. As men now look back on that troubled period of history, they can perceive over the span of years, various causes which contributed to the entire effect. Catholics and non-Catholics alike will agree today on the overall situation. One cause was certainly the corruption in the church, the corruption above all of the bishops and even the popes. It's a striking fact to realize that the church could survive such a period in its history, a period in which it was so often governed by men who had little interest in the lofty spiritual aims of religion. When popes and bishops become enmeshed in concern for temporal goods, in even the pleasures of sex, in the political schemes of kings, well, the entire church suffers. The priests, as a result, were not well trained, nor particularly pious. Monasteries had fallen from their ideals, and the laity were so neglected that they scarcely ever heard a sermon. Now, when we describe these things, you also have to remember that this was not a uniform experience. In some places, the church was good and strong, and in some places, it was terrible. So, you have to keep that in mind when we talk about this uh, time for reform. In England, the church was pretty well off. In Germany, it was pretty bad. Nevertheless, throughout the period, Great saints did arise and attempt to ward off the approaching crisis, and God did show that he was able to preserve his church even under such conditions. Christ had foretold that the gates of hell would perhaps cause problems, but not ultimately prevail against his church. Human weakness would not prevail either. The difficulty was that while some good was being accomplished, it was seemingly never enough all the plans for reform drawn up at the Lateran councils and afterward never achieved the full sweeping reforms that were demanded. Just before Luther came on the scene, the last such effort at reformation within the church took place. The Fifth Lateran Council meeting from 1512 to 1517. Remember, 1517 is when Luther nailed those theses to the castle door. It's generally looked upon as a rather weak council, not because it refused to take positive steps of reform. It did, but the council is considered weak because of our overwhelming realization today of how insignificant those steps were in the long run. In fact, really, it's a reminder that implementation of a council can be at least as important as a council itself. Possibly those who took part in the proceedings failed to perceive the change in the air, the gravity of the situation. A new world was in the making, but in a way that Lateran V seems to have lived out its days with only an eye to the past. The 15th century had been a great turning point in history. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 had brought with it a great influx of Greek scholars into the West. Their influence inspired new interest in the ancient culture of the Greeks and the Romans, what we call the Renaissance. This humanism reached its golden age at the time of Pope Leo X. At this precise moment, Luther entered the scene. 
The so-called Renaissance popes were often the sponsors of the artistic and cultural works of humanism. But this also distracted them from their primary religious concerns. At times, Lateran V gives one the impression of being an ecclesiastical literary society. Beautiful sermons were preached, excessive in their praise of the Renaissance popes. What was accomplished in regard to reform, however, was more or less an unsuccessful repetition of the other Lateran councils of the 12th century. The immediate occasion for the council was another schismatic movement, one associated with the so-called Council of Pisa. The city had been an important name in the history of Greek Western schism, and this might have been a similar threat. While the Reformation movement was gradually forming itself, the Renaissance popes were once again engaged in the endless quarrels with Christian princes. This had marked the entire Middle Ages. This time, Louis VII of France became irritated by the line of action followed by Pope Julius II, and he summoned a council at Pisa in 1511. Fourteen or so bishops and four discontented cardinals attended. The meeting, a, reputi a repetition of Constance and Basil, declared that the general council was superior to the pope. It seems that Julius II had already thought of holding a general council of his own. The act of the French king just spurred him on. He convoked a council to be held at Rome the following year. It was necessary to meet the action of the king and these bishops with a clear-cut response. And so, his idea was dueling councils. The council at Pisa had actually never amounted to much. Its threat to Rome was soon extinguished. The Fifth Lateran Council opened on May 10, 1512, but was hindered from the start by wars, by the interference of kings, and by a general lack of interest in the council to start with. There were never more than a hundred or 150 bishops who answered the summons to attend, and these were mostly Italians. The sessions were separated at times by months. The first two were held in May, the third and fourth in December of 1512. When the next session was held in February of 1513, Pope Julius II was dying, and the council had to wait to be reconvened by the next pope, who was Leo X. Leo did this in April of that year, and a number of the other sessions were held, April, June, and December 1513, May in 1514, May in 1515, December 1516, and finally in March of 1517. What the council did accomplish was the rooting out of the schism at Pisa. The most important discussions concerned the pragmatic sanction of Bourges. In 1438, the king of France had issued this edict, affirming that a general council was superior to the pope and denying the Roman pontiff the right to nominate bishops in France. A later king had abolished this decree in 1461, but Louis VII had attempted to reintroduce it. The Fifth Lateran Council clearly rejected this teaching contained in the edict. It thus contributed another strong statement concerning the primacy of Peter in the Church and the primacy of the Pope over a council. In addition, a number of decrees were issued concerning certain philosophical errors, papal charities, and another crusade against the Turks. This last caused a real concern outside Rome. It was no longer the Middle Ages, and such an appeal met with no enthusiasm at all. The turn of events was to relegate such a venture to oblivion. Well, the Fifth Lateran Council had closed in March of 1517, and in October the same year, Luther launched his attack. As with many others, Luther shared in the spirit of the age that produced his revolt. He too was concerned about the need for reform in the church and upset by the laxity and corruption within it. At the start, he had not intended to leave the church, but to improve the church, but it came increasingly clear that the positions he adopted 
meant really only one thing, a break with Rome. From the start, the close relationship between Luther's positions and that of Wycliffe and of Huss were clearly recognized. Luther and John Eck had debated that very point in their discussions at Leipzig in July 1519. It was inevitable, since the very same causes had been operating to form the mind of Huss that produced Luther and the other reformers. The general laxity of the church was certainly one of the contributing causes. Luther finally chose as a solution the denial of the priestly office entirely. From this followed his errors in regard to the nature of the church and of the sacraments. Another contributing cause was the strong emphasis on mysticism, the direct and personal approach to God. The individualism, which so often marks Protestant thinking, reflects an exaggeration of that mystical spirit. The visible church is considered as no longer necessary or essential. In fact, even it could be an obstacle, hindering the soul from its direct contact with God. This approach, accompanied with the recognition of general moral laxity, can easily lead to a full rejection of the church in its entirety. There's a third cause recognizable in this movement, the decline of philosophy. The great speculative minds of the 13th century were now gone, and second-rate minds had taken their place. The result was a kind of decadent scholasticism. The general philosophy of the 16th century was what we now term nominalism. It was concerned more with words or names than with discussing reality. Hence the term. It comes from the Latin nomen, which means name. Philosophers had now become tied to words themselves rather than what they stood for. They juggled them back and forth in various statements. They played games with words, as it were. This too prepared the way for the revolt. Luther is described as a fervent disciple of William of Ockham, a leader of the nominalists. It was this, above all, that enabled Luther to formulate his teaching that a man can be a sinner and a saint at one and the same time. His faulty philosophy also had much to do with the position that he adopted in regard to the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. On the other hand, the decay of philosophy had introduced another note into the picture. Things had now become very much codified. Philosophy had taken on kind of a legalistic spirit. This state of affairs helped kill philosophy and tire men's souls. When the interest of the humanists presented a new concern for Scripture, and when the invention of the printing press made Bibles available, men gladly turned to the simplicity of Scripture. It was so little codified that it pleased them. The translations of the Bible were made in most of the modern languages, which by this time had reached a fair amount of stability. Long before Luther appeared, there were German Bibles in print. This was all the spirit of the times. Over in Switzerland, a similar movement was underway. Two months after Luther was born in 1483, Ulrich Zwingli was born in Switzerland. He studied at Vienna and Basel. In 1506, he became a priest. Zwingli was also influenced by humanism, and he developed an interest in scripture above all. About 1522, he came into prominence as a reformer, but he was not following the steps of Luther in this. He had shared the same spirit, but he came to his own conclusions. As a result, from the very start, the revolt was divided into two parties. This division remains in Protestant Protestantism today, multiplied, of course, many times over, Reformed and Lutheran. When, at a later date, Luther and Zwingli did come together to attempt some agreement, nothing was solved. They were divided, especially on the question of the real presence, and they remain divided. Luther, of course, was insistent that Christ was truly present in the Eucharist, and Zwingli thought that it was a symbolic representation, a memorial only. Zwingli was also greatly opposed to images in church, Luther did not share this position, and Lutheran churches basically continued on looking on the outside 
and the inside the same way they did before the Reformation. In many ways, the Zwinglian version of Protestantism is what became identified mainly with Protestantism. The great name of the Swiss Reformation, however, was not to appear on the scene for another decade. John Calvin, or Jean Calvin. He was born a Catholic in 1509, but set aside the faith of his youth about 1534. The Protestantism that he embraced, however, was more along the lines of Zwingli than of Luther, to which he added his own special approach. Lutheranism and Calvinism were thus the big problems of the 16th century. Luther emphasized that one is saved by faith alone, but to him this meant something more like trust. Faith, hope, and love were sort of combined into one. Calvin, Calvin stressed that the free, choice, uh, the free choice really belongs to God in terms of salvation, so that the only predestined, only the predestined belonged to the church, the invisible church, those whom God has chosen for heaven. In Calvin's system, this meant that all others were predestined for hell in the same fashion. You are predestined one direction or another. In both movements, however, there was an acceptance of Scripture as the sole rule of faith, nothing else being needed. They held the conviction that Scripture was so clear that anyone who read it would immediately grasp the true meaning. The obvious fact that they disagreed among themselves on certain passages, important passages, failed to weaken that conviction, nor did they perceive any difficulty because of their mutual rejection of the scriptural interpretation of the Anabaptists, the forerunners of the present-day Baptists, those who rejected infant baptism. Thus, they were rebaptizing people who had been baptized as infants. To this, of course, was also added more breakup, the defection of the Church of England under Henry VIII in 1534. Now, Henry was not really a part of the Protestant movement. In fact, he wrote a book against Luther. And he was not really interested in this emphasis on Scripture alone either. The main thing was he rejected papal supremacy because of his quarrel with the Pope over his marriage. Later on, others in England would introduce some Protestant elements into Anglicanism, although even to this day it has not been identified entirely with the approach developed by Luther or Calvin. Anglicanism continues as its own separate tradition. Scotland did adopt a Protestant faith in the Presbyterianism introduced especially by John Knox. This was derived directly from Calvinism at a time when Knox was living in Geneva. Presbyterianism appeared about 1560. Well, this was the world that the popes of the 16th century faced, and it was an overwhelming problem. The whole Christian world seemed torn asunder, and entire sections of various countries had rejected the faith of Rome. The need for reform within the church, now more far apparent than ever before, could no longer be sidestepped. A reform from top to bottom was needed if anything was to be salvaged. The Council of Trent was to accomplish this task. Trent, however, was not concerned solely with disciplinary questions. Doctrinally, it ranks with the great councils of the first centuries. It added decrees on the nature of faith and justification that served to emphasize and clarify the primacy of grace that had been taught in the disputes with the Pelagians in the 5th century. The council had set forth in precise terms the Catholic teaching on these matters as a response to the doctrine of Luther on faith and the doctrine of Calvin on predestination. Closely linked to these was the teaching of Trent on the theological explanation of original sin. The decrees on the sacraments, above all those on the Eucharist and on the sacrifice of the Mass, have been directives for the theological progress of the past 400 years. In discussing the history of Trent, we're faced with a mass of detail. It would take volumes to treat all that this council accomplished. Remember how thick the decrees are that they published. The council lasted on and on for 18 years, 
from 1545 to 1563. There were some lengthy interruptions. Pope Leo X had been Pope when Luther began his public preaching in 1517. He did condemn certain of Luther's teachings in 1520, but this didn't stop anything. Pope Adrian VI succeeded him in 1522, but he did not live long enough to do much, although he did admit that the great corruption in the church is what brought this problem upon us. The first desire for the council was expressed by Pope Clement VII, but he died in 1534 before anything was done. He reigned during 11 crucial years, but he was not the man to deal with the situation. He was possibly afraid of calling a council. He was also by nature a man not given to making decisions. On the other hand, when he saw the need of a council, the political situation may have been too great of an obstacle. Clement is perhaps not entirely to blame for the long delay. Under Pope Paul III, the decisive steps were finally taken. Paul III surely ranks among the great popes of history. From the start of his reign, he envisioned a general council. He began with a reform of affairs at Rome, in the Roman Curia, the papal court, from the members of the Curia, considerable opposition was to arise, even in times of crisis when the entire world seemed poised for collapse. There are always those selfish souls who think only of themselves and their own interests. This era was no exception. And that's what you found in the Curia. In addition, the Christian emperors were to raise their usual difficulties they continued to do so throughout the entire council. Paul III finally did convoke a council to be held at Mantua in 1537, but nothing came of it. There was still an interest in having the Lutherans attend, but they had refused. At this time, of course, the lines between Catholic and Lutheran were still quite vague. Cities joined the revolt only gradually and sometimes almost imperceptibly. Thus, one of the chief purposes of the council was to seek reunion, a goal, though, that was never achieved. This stillborn council was prolonged until the next year. That is, the council was discontinued without being dissolved. The next attempt was to be held at Vicenza, Vicenza not even sure if I'm saying that right, Vicenza in 1538. But again, nothing came of it. That's why we've never heard of Vincenza. The Pope could not hold a council if, after convoking it, no one showed up. But this is basically what was happening. The King of France kept his bishops from attending. The Duke of Mantua, where the first attempt was made, didn't really show any interest. And the German bishops were too harassed at home to leave for fear of what they would find when they got back. The French now also objected to Vicenza as a site for the council. For much of this time, only the Pope seemed really interested in having the council at all. In 1539, further attempts were made to reconcile the Emperor Charles V and the King of France, Francis I. They had continued warring and were thus obstacles to the proposed council. Attempts were also made to contact the Lutherans but the many discussions proved fruitless. All of these negotiations went on and on, while from time to time equally fruitless attempts were made to convoke a council. Not until the Peace of Crespi in 1544 put an end to the war did plans for a council finally begin to take shape. In November of that year, Paul III issued a decree calling for a council to be held at Trent, in northern Italy. Now remember, Italy is not a country at this time. It's an area. And basically, um, Trent is up in the Alps, and it's kind of closer to Germany than it is to Rome. They speak Italian there, but the, the culture is much more in line with the Germanic uh, kingdoms. In his book on the history of Trent, Father O'Malley points out how the Council of Constance which had dealt with that papal schism when was the high watermark of conciliarism 
had the unintended consequence of pushing off reform for a general council. Constance began a new relationship between Pope and council, an adversarial relationship, which delayed Trent. The Pope's dismay that a council might get out of control or even be used as a tool against them. Trent ended up happening because it needed to happen. Corruption and the homemade attempts at reform had broken the church and a council was needed to pick up the pieces. The council finally opened officially on December 13, 1545. It had been hoped that meetings would start off in spring of that year, but it took all these months until a sufficient number of bishops were present. Even then, the number was surprisingly small, about 30 bishops altogether. The largest number at Trent was 199, the number who, along with other representatives, signed the final decrees 18 years later. Basically, the council grew and grew as it continued along. The history of this council can be studied far better than many of the earlier councils, thanks especially to the untiring efforts of Angelo Massarelli, the secretary throughout the entire period. He is a delight to the historian because of his thoroughness, including at times such small details as a list of the food served at the banquets. The acts of the council also give us close account of the discussions and the voting. Further insights are gained by the day-to-day -day diaries kept by Massarelli and others. In addition, the correspondence of some of the bishops has also been preserved. The council is one council, but it really has to be divided into three periods. The first one under Pope Paul III, from 1545 to 1549. The second period, under Pope Julius III, from 1551 to 1552. And then finally, the third period, under Pope Pius IV, from 1562 to 1563. Because of the extreme length of the council altogether, the names that figure prominently change from time to time. We almost should speak of three different councils. Most of all, those who were present for the opening session were dead or too old or feeble to attend the closing session. Outwardly, the sessions were far more calm and orderly than some of the earlier councils. However, the issues were complex and the discussions were intense. Massarelli recounts a few small incidents, but nothing too upsetting. The best known is perhaps the reaction of one bishop to a rather critical remark he had overheard concerning his supposed ignorance in theological matters. The insulted bishop turned to his accuser and took hold of his beard with both hands, giving it a good tug and extracting a few of the hairs in the process. The papal legates descended on them and put them both in time out for a while. But considering the upheavals of other days, this hardly even merits a mention. In the first period, the three papal legates presided, Cardinal Crivini, Cardinal Del Monte, and Cardinal Pole from England. Actually, the first two dominated the proceedings. A manner of procedure was established by which the bishops, known as the major theologians, would gather together in groups under each of the three legates. They would then discuss the decrees that had been suggested, and the results of these separate discussions would be reported in a united session later. If a special problem arose, a vote would be taken. If further discussion was desired, the bishops could refer the matter to the so-called minor theologians, men trained in theology but not bishops and thus not able to vote. Resident experts. The bishops could attend these discussions of the minor theologians and gain further insights into the matters treated. When the decrees were finally formulated, uh, a vote would be held at which they would be formally accepted. The first period included four solemn sessions in which decrees on doctrine and discipline were issued. The fourth session concerned scripture and apostolic traditions, the fifth, original sin, the sixth, the problem of justification, and the seventh, questions about the sacraments of baptism, 
and confirmation especially. Discussions had begun concerning the Eucharist, but other difficulties arose. For one thing, the council was transferred from Trent to Bologna in March of 1547. Trent was far from a comfortable city in those days. It was quite a small place, and it was hoped that Bologna would be more healthful and comfortable a location. This move later became the occasion of disputes rising from those few members who had not been in favor of the change. The emperor, Charles V, was strongly opposed to it. Wars and intrigue complicated the situation once more. Charles even hinted open opposition to the papal council, with the ever-present fear of schism. Because of these various difficulties, Paul III had decided to suspend the council temporarily. His death in 1549 closed the period of the council. After Pope Paul died, the council continued in session long enough to elect the next pontiff. They chose Cardinal Del Monte, the papal legate, who took the name Julius III. The new pope would soon indicate his intention of continuing the council. But he too ran into difficulties. The next period did not really get underway until 1551. The question had to be debated as to whether or not the council would continue at Trent and whether it would be a continuation of the Council of Paul III or a completely new council. Beneath this debate was the old theme of conciliarism. The emperor had challenged the right of the pope to transfer a council. Even the face of the Protestant upheaval, the church had to fight this error among its more faithful members. Julius III won out, and the council reconvened as a continuation of the first one. Cardinal Curvini was now rather ill. He could not continue as a papal legate. This role was assumed by Cardinal Crescenzi, who was designated as the only president. Two others were appointed as to what amounted as assistant legates. On May 1, 1551, the first session of this new period, the 11th session of Trent, was held. This time, a number of German bishops also appeared, but the total still remained pretty small. In this second period, short as it was, there were further discussions on the Eucharist and the sacraments of penance and extreme unction. Decrees were issued concerning them at the 13th and 14th sessions in October and November of that year. There was still some hope that the Protestants would be able to attend the gathering. A number of representatives did actually arrive an attempt to make plans in January of 1552. By this time, however, not much was to be expected from such discussions. Bitterness was pretty strong on all sides. In addition, wars were breaking out again. The Emperor Charles had to flee to Innsbruck for safety, and because of this generally upset state of affairs, the council came to an end again in April of 1552, suspended for ten more years before it would reconvene. Pope Julius III died in March of 1555 without being able to continue the council. Carvini was elected Pope, Marcellus II, but reigned only from April 10th to May, uh, May 1st when he died. Paul IV then ascended to the throne of Peter. This new pontiff had no interest in a general council. He had determined to reform things by himself. His excessive measures, however, proved at least one thing, that a council was needed to complete the work it had begun. When Pius IV became Pope in 1559, Therefore, he began working slowly and patiently for reopening the council. By April of 1561, the new papal legates were able to enter Trent. This time, Cardinal Gonzaga served as the first president. Hosius, Serapando, and Simonetta were auxiliary legates. Although the council was to have opened in April of 1561, there were not enough bishops present for many more months. 
not until January 18, 1562, did the third period of the council really get underway. It was to prove the most difficult time of all, mostly because of the old problem of the conciliar theory. The discussions on the Mass and Holy Orders had been postponed time and time again. Now, as the work neared completion, these questions had to be faced. In doing this, the matter of the relationship of bishops to Pope could not be avoided in the discussions on Holy Orders, which led to further difficulties. There were many complicated maneuvers of this period. By the summer of 1562, the Pope was seriously considering dissolving the Council. By means of outstanding diplomacy, however, Pius IV placated all concerned, and in September it looked as though the Council would now hurry on to a peaceful end. Such was not to be the case. The debates were renewed, and it became apparent that it was too dangerous to let things go on in such a troubled state. The Pope now sent on directions that the legates should drop all points on which no agreement could be reached, and have the bishops vote on those points which cause no trouble. Basically, the council would say what it could say, and what it couldn't say, well, it just wouldn't say anything. This did not hurry along the debating, however. Finally, in March of 1563, a change took place when a number of the leading figures died, including Cardinal Gonzaga, the papal legate. To replace him, there came the hero of the entire session, Cardinal Moroni, a man providentially prepared for this moment. Moroni was the soul of diplomacy, and with him, and with the help of a few others, he was able to bring the council to a peaceful conclusion, referring to the Pope all other matters over which they dared not delay. The 22nd session had taken place in September of 1562. The 23rd now took place in July of 1563. The 24th came in November of the same year, and the 25th and final session on December 3rd and 4th. Throughout all of this confusion, the third period of the Council still managed to issue an amazing number of important decrees, one concerning the Eucharist, another treating of the sacrifice of the Mass. The much-discussed question of the Sacrament of Holy Orders was the topic of a separate decree. The last two sessions issued teachings on marriage, purgatory, indulgences, and the use of images. As Cardinal Moroni intoned the, thanks, the Te Deum of Thanksgiving over the final signing, there was no question about the gratitude in the hearts of those present. In one of the most troubled periods in the history of the Church, the Council of Trent had effected the most far-reaching reforms. And this time, most importantly, they took effect. Pius IV solemnly confirmed the decrees of the Council and set about completing the remaining tasks, the reform of the Missal and Breviary, the writing of a catechism based on the decrees of Trent, the appointing of a commission to issue a more exact edition of the Latin Bible, the Vulgate. This work was continued also by his successor, Pope St. Pius V. And basically everyone was on board to implement the council, the Pope, the bishops, and the secular rulers. The Church had recovered from the crisis of the 16th century, but it was not unable to undo the evil wrought about by the revolt. The sad remembrances are still with us today. The Western world sees the continued separation of those who rejected the Church 400 years ago. History looks back on the united Christendom that once was, and the Church of Rome looks to those separated with the sincere desire of reunion. Christ wills that we be one. As Pius XII explained, the Church waits for them with open arms to come not to a stranger's house, but to their own, their father's house. At a desperate time, a council was needed for reform and reconciliation. It came too late for reconciliation, but the reform was achieved at last. The saddest part is that if the earlier medieval councils had been fully implemented and achieved their goals of reform, the reconciliation 
never would have been needed in the first place. And I wanted to follow up with some observations from Father O'Malley's lecture on Trent, linked down below. In our own day, the council is often remembered for things it didn't actually do. That is, it's known by persistent myths and misunderstandings that deserve to be corrected. These are some of the things he mentioned. The first misunderstanding was that Trent was a council of repression. You know, the index of forbidden books, uh, taking over marriage, the Inquisition. Actually, the index was produced before the council, and for a while it was given to the council for them to mitigate, but they never got around to it. The problem of clandestine marriages was real, and it was addressed before, but it, the problem had persisted. And the Inquisition was actually formed independently of the council, and it was different in different places, often heavily colored by the localities. And in fact, the council's reforms were aimed almost totally at the ordained, mainly at the bishops. It's kind of a, a bit of a miracle of this council, bishops willing and able to reform themselves. The second misunderstanding was that it, it exacerbated religious divisions. It did not. The fact is, it was called for reconciliation. The emperor wanted reconciliation. The, the pope wanted reconciliation. Pope Paul III was very interested in reconciliation, even at that later date in the central session. He took the unprecedented step of laying down that no one would be condemned by name. Only false doctrines would be condemned. That's not how it had been in the past. Protestants were invited. Even Eastern Orthodox and non-Chalcedonian Orthodox were invited. The fact is, it was just simply too late for reconciliation to be probable. And a third misconception was that it was a monochromatic and efficient affair. It was certainly not. That's part of the reason why it dragged on for so long. It was at times chaotic. It was certainly complex. And at times it had a very independent spirit. At times the Pope was ready to just quit over his frustration with the Council. But thankfully it persisted and succeeded. Some other misunderstandings that O'Malley mentioned was the how people think that it banned the vernacular liturgy. It didn't. How it banned vernacular Bibles. It didn't. In fact, those were already around. How it made the Vulgate the only Bible. It didn't. It just said it's authentic or reliable. How it started liturgical reform. Well, it, it did in a sense that it had one line that mentioned it, but really that happened because it was needed, because you had the invention of the printing press and you had so many problems in different texts and copies of the Missal and so on, and basically things needed to be codified and, and unified and, and made certain for the printing press. And the last one was the misconception that people think it established celibacy for the clergy. It, it didn't. That was established a long time before this, but um, it was certainly a problem at the time. And in fact, they considered uh, there were a lot of requests from Germany for celibacy to be relaxed, at least for that area. But because it was not so much a concern in other places like um, Italy and in Spain, um, who had a lot more represent, representation at the council, um, that idea was just never pushed and never went anywhere. Well, thank you for joining us. This monumental Council of Trent would suffice for the next 400 years. It would hold through the Renaissance and Enlightenment up to the birth of modern times. So next time, we will look at the issues faced by the First Vatican Council. If you're in Dallas, I invite you to come by and check us out and join us for worship. You can look us up and learn all about us at stfrancisdallas.org. Please like and share, and we will see you there. God bless. Glory to you. Glory to you.